Um, I will send the link for the recording and the notes again today, later on. And, you know, then you have them as a reference um, for whatever you need them, whenever you need them. So today we're going to be looking at Numbers 2, verses 1 to 34. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to number Numbers 4, Numbers, sorry, number 2, Numbers 2, chapter 2, verses 1 to 34. This is where God gave uh, Moses instructions on how to arrange the children of Israel when they were in camp and when they traveled. Now, you may think, what has that got to do with us today? Why is it important for us to understand how God arranged them? Well, it's an amazing thing, and let's just go over it. So when they were to camp or they were traveling, the tabernacle would be in the center. That includes the tent of meeting and, and the outer court and the brazen altar and the whole thing. When they would be placed in the center of the, the camp. And then from the center towards the east, there was three tribes, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, totaling 186, 400 divisions. Now, if you have a pen and a paper, you maybe want to write these down. Maybe I'll even put them in the notes. Um, to the east, there were 186,400 divisions. Okay? So then the next one, from the center to the south, to the south, there were the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And that totaled 151, 450 divisions. Okay? So you can see the numbers are a little bit different here, right? Then from the center towards the west, um, we have Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. And that equals... To the west, we have 108, 100 divisions. Okay. And then the last one from the center to the north. To the north, we have um, Dan, Asher, and Niftali. And their divisions equals 157. 600. Oh, I, I did that wrong. It's not Borth, it's North on the <laughs> section. So if you look at the numbers here, you can see to the South and to the North, the numbers are just about equal. And then from the East, they're much larger and the West is much shorter. So this is in the sign of a cross. So to the West would be the 108, 101, that's this little piece up here, right? And to the east is a large one, 186, 400. And then the south and north, they're just about even. So they would camp in the shape of the cross. Not only would they camp in the shape of the cross, but when they traveled, they would travel in the same shape of the cross so if their enemies went up on the hills to look down on them they've seen this great big massive cross moving across the desert now of course at this time they had no idea what the cross meant they had no idea that they were in the shape of a cross they had no idea why god set them up that way but it is to show us that God does everything with a purpose, right? The cross was in the make. The cross was in the plan before the foundation of the world. Before the world was built, God knew what was going to happen. He knew the problems that there was going to be. And so he determined that Jesus would die on the cross. Now, why on a cross? Why would Jesus die on a cross? Well, that's very interesting for us to see. If you remember the story of 
Eden, when um, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, there was two trees that were, were special. There was a tree of knowledge and good and evil and the tree of life. And God told them that they could eat of any tree except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just excuse me here. I've had a cold for the last few days here. So why, why did he tell them that they couldn't eat from that tree? If you look at society today and you look at the situation today, if that tree had not been in the garden, we would be in a lot better condition in the world than what we are now. That tree brought us a lot of problems. So why would God even put that tree in the Garden of Eden? If that tree was going to cause us so many problems, why have it there? And that's important for us to understand because a lot of people ask you the question, if you're in ministry, you're going to get this question oftentimes. And it actually really surprises me how many Christians cannot answer this question. But the question is, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there so much evil in the world today? These are valid questions. You know, th these are questions that people have. And I'm, I just blows me away that, that so many Christians can't answer that question. And it all has to do with love. God created us to love and to be loved. But in order to love, there has to be a choice, right? There has to be a choice. Without choice, you can't love. If you say to your wife or your husband or your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever, if you say, you have to love me, I think we're all men here, so I hope, hopefully nobody has a boyfriend. You have to love me. Then, then they're not going to love you, right? If I tell my wife she has no choice, she has to love me, she's not going to love me. She might do what I tell her to do. She might, you know, comply with what I'm saying, but there's not going to be any love there whatsoever, right? Because love has to be a choice. And so God always gives us freedom of choice. And he put that tree of knowledge and good and evil in the garden so that... Um, Adam and Eve would have a choice whether they were going to follow what God was telling them to do. With that tree, they had the choice, and we know what happened. They made the wrong choice. So God knew that they were going to make that wrong choice. He knew what was going to happen. He knew the law was going to come. He knew the children of Israel were going to be in bondage. He knew they were going to come out and go through the wilderness. And so he was preparing us for the fact that the cross was going to be a very significant thing in our life. Now that tree of knowledge or that tree of life, every tree has fruit on it. And we know that it is a fruit that, that we enjoy from the tree. Had Adam and Eve eaten from the tree of life after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and the evil, then they would have been in a terrible situation. And that's why God sent them out of the garden of Eden. He did not send them out of the Garden of Eden as a punishment, but to stop them from partaking of the tree of life, because had they partaken of that tree of life in their fallen state, they would have lived forever, but with sickness, with pain, with all these other things. And so they were sent out of that garden, and there was two cherubims placed with flaming swords, stopping anybody from coming into that garden. When we go to Jesus on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, excuse me, the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place ripped in two. And on that curtain was two cherubims. And on the mercy seat of God were two cherubims with their wings touching each other. It is to show us that God was taken away from the Garden of Eden, those cherubims that were there protecting the tree of life, and Jesus became the fruit of the tree of life. The tree of life was a cross. It was made from wood. That's why Jesus had to die on a cross. It was made from wood, and he became the fruit 
of that tree of life. When we eat of the fruit of the tree of life, we have eternal life. When we eat of Jesus who was on the cross, we have eternal life. So that is a fruit for us. So that eternal life is there important. So the cross was an absolute important and integral part of this whole plan. Because really, they beat Jesus within an inch of his life. They could have just beat him a few more times and he would have died. You know, so why put him on the cross? But he had to be on the cross because he was the fruit of life. It is through him that we have eternal life. It is through him that we gain access to God and we live in this eternal being. So this cross was a sign um, to, to the spirit realm and even to the physical realm that the cross was going to be very important. Satan may have thought that when he seen Jesus hanging on the cross that they had won a victory. But the truth was they didn't win the victory. The truth was that Jesus overcame death. He went down into Hades. He took the key, uh, uh, keys away from the authority, away from Satan, and gave it back to man where it was intended to be. Satan today is somebody that makes a lot of noise, tells a lot of lies, but really has no power because all his authority has been taken away from him and has been given back to us. So this is why it was so important for God to use this sign of the cross moving through the wilderness. It must have been quite a sight to see that, to be up on top of a mountain and to see these two million people moving in the shape of a cross across the desert floor. It would have been an amazing thing. And I'm sure it invoked a lot of fear on many of their enemies as well. So I hope that's been a blessing to you. So we're going to move on to Numbers 13. If you have your Bible with you, just skip over to Numbers 13. And we're going to talk about a couple of chapters here. This is a story that we all know. This is the story of when Moses sent the 12 spies into Canaan land. They spent 40 days traveling through the land to see what the land was like. And Moses gave them instructions. He said, go through and onto the hill country. Um, and he told them to see what the land is like, whether the people there are strong or weak, or if there's few or if there's many of them. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad land? What types of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How, how is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? And bring some of the fruit of the land. So Moses sent these guys, these 12, into the land. And they went and explored the land. They went throughout the land in the valley of Ishikol. They cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. And they had to carry it on a pole between two men. It was such a big cluster of grapes. I've seen a lot of grapes growing in my life, but I've never seen a bunch of grapes that would have to be carried on a pole between two men. So that must have been quite an amazing sight to see a cluster of grapes that was that big. Amen. So they went in to the land. They were exploring the land. They showed them the fruit. They brought some pomegranates and figs and this cluster of grapes, and they said the land is flowing with milk and honey. But they said the people there are mighty. The cities are fortified and large. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anark. And the Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites and Jezebites, Jubasites. And Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites near the sea and along the Jordan. And Caleb said to the people, you know what? Yes, there, there are a lot of people there. Yes, there are giants there. But remember what God has done for us. This is a, a pivotal point in the journey from Egypt to the promised land. Because here they had an opportunity to look at all the things that God has done for them in the last year 
and put their faith in God that God would sustain them, even though it looked like the land was unconquerable. It, had they put their faith in God, they would have been able to head into the promised land right there and then, and they would have had victory. However, we know that they doubted. This is an important thing for us to understand as children of God. Without faith, and it tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For we must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Everything in the kingdom of God is accessed through faith. It's accessed through faith. It's not accessed by your works. It's not accessed by praying just right. It's not accessed by doing the right sacrifices. Everything is accessed by faith. And so if we are not going to walk by faith, then we are walking by sight. And even though it seems like we should be able to see more walking by sight than by faith, the truth is we do not see more when we are walking by sight rather than by faith. And so God gave them an opportunity here for them to step out in faith, to believe that they could conquer even these giants and all the people in the land because God was with them. Remember what they've gone through. I mean, they were they were taken out of Egypt after they had been um, enslaved there for many generations. Uh, he miraculously brought them out. He brought them to the Red Sea. He separated the Red Sea. They passed on dry ground. All the Egyptians were killed when they tried to come after them. He provided water for them whenever they needed it. He provided protection for them whenever they needed it. He gave them food every morning and food every night. And so God was looking after them. Excuse me. But they failed to see that. They failed to grab hold of that and, and lay hold of it. There's a scripture in Romans chapter 1. I'm not sure if I shared this with you before, but it's, it's a very important scripture. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. I'm just going to turn there. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. He's talking about believers here. And he says to them, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images that were made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. These were people who knew God. It says, for although they knew God, they stopped giving glory to God and they stopped giving thanks to God. We must be very, very careful that we don't fall into that because that can be a trap that op opens up a door that leads to destruction. That's why testimonies are so important. And oftentimes I think testimonies are misunderstood. A testimony, your testimony or a testimony of your life is not about you. A testimony is not about people. A testimony is about what God has done for you. It's what God has done in your life. Not what you've done, but what God has done. I remember one time listening to a guy giving a testimony who went on for quite some time. And at the end of it, I just thinking, well, that really wasn't a testimony because it wasn't about God. It was about his life and about what he had done in his life. And that it really wasn't a testimony. And that's what that can happen to us very easily, right? We need to give glory to God for everything that happens in our life. And this is what happened with the children of Israel here. They were not giving glory to God for the things he'd done for them. They did not give glory to God from, from the Passover when the death angel went over the land and killed all the firstborn of Egypt. He, they didn't give glory to God when they got to the Red Sea and he opened up the Red Sea for them. They didn't give glory to God when they got to the spring and the spring had bitter water and Moses threw a piece of wood in and it healed the water and they were all able to drink. They didn't give glory to God when they started picking manna up every morning and, and collected quail every night. 
You know, they, they didn't give thanks to God for these things. They didn't give glory to God for these things. So it's very important for us to have a time in our congregations and with our ministries where people are able to give testimony to what God has done. And if God does a miracle and you're involved with it or whatever, you should spend the first 20 minutes or so giving glory to God before you start phoning all your friends and telling them about it. The glory belongs to God. The recognition belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. And so it's important for us to see that and to see that, uh, you know, that we give this glory to God. Now, the children of Israel here, they didn't do this. Because they had not formed uh, a practice of doing that, then they were slipping away in this opportunity that they had to walk by faith. They had this opportunity where God has put a situation in front of them where they could have walked by faith, but they failed, right? They failed. And this can happen to us so easily when we're not giving recognition to God. In our church, we have a time every Sunday morning for people to give testimonies. And, you know, one or two or a few people get up and give testimonies all the time. Other people don't. But what we do is we listen to what God has done and we give a great clap offering to God for what he has done. We're recognizing, we're giving glory to him for what he has done. That way, when we come to a situation like this, we can say, well, we know what God has done. We know what God has done in our lives. We know what God has done in other people's lives. So why would this be any different? And that's what Caleb said, right? Caleb silenced the people and he said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Caleb had faith. And this is what our walk in the wilderness is all about. Our walk from Egypt to the promised land is learning to walk by faith. And we're going to see as we go through next time uh, in our next session, how much the descendants of the original people that came out of Egypt, how they learned to have faith in God and to trust God. But this is important for our life, that we need to come to a point where we can put our faith and our trust absolutely in God. Because without being able to put our faith and our trust in God, we can never reach the destiny that he has for us. We can never enter the promised land that he has for us. Now, as I said before, the promised land is not heaven. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about the, what God has designed you to do on this earth how he has designed you to increase the kingdom of God here on this earth. And we're going to talk about that in our next session. But it's important for us to walk in relationship with God and allow our faith to grow in him with the experiences that we have with him by being in the word of God and by allowing him to, to speak to us. So the people that were with Caleb and Joshua that had gone up, he says, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. They spread out amongst the people and started spreading a bad report saying, the people are too big and the land devours those who are living in it. They did not have faith. They were not walking in faith. Amen. They were not walking in faith. They were, they were walking by sight. They were looking with their eyes what they could see. And all they could see was the number of people and the size of the people and the fortified cities. And they, they said, how, how can we do this? There's no way we can do this. It doesn't matter what Caleb and what Joshua said. There's no possible way that we can do this. So we have to be careful that we don't get caught into that, that rut. The longer it takes for you to establish your faith in God so that you walk with him with complete trust is how long it's going to take you before you enter into the promised land or enter into the destiny that he has for you. I think I've mentioned this before, but with the children of Israel, the ones that left Egypt, two million 
they they had a purpose. God had a purpose for them. He had a destiny for them. Their destiny was in the promised land. But out of that two million, only two reached the promised land because the others refused to put their faith in God. They refused to, to set their faith in God. And that that can be a very big stumbling block for us. And it, it's just, it's imperative that we walk with faith. It's imperative that we put our trust in God because without that, we get stuck in this place. Here, the children of Israel, most of them got stuck in this place. They didn't maybe stay at Mount Sinai, but they spent 40 years in the wilderness until they all died off. Why did they spend 40 days in the, or 40 years in the wilderness? Because they didn't trust God. They didn't put faith in him. They didn't develop their intimate relationship with God. And this is what this journey is about. It's about us developing an intimacy with God, a relationship with him that we can put our complete trust in him. That we know that whatever happens, he's got our back. Whatever situation we go through, it may be the worst situation and very, very difficult, but we know he's right there with us. And if we can't even seem to walk through through the situation we're going through, he'll pick us up and carry us. But we have to come to that point where we trust him absolutely. Because without an absolute trust, it's not possible for us to do that, right? But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they they spread out and spread uh, bad reports. And they said, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. They compared themselves to what the people look like. King David is probably a great example for us. When King David, as a young boy, before he was king, went to his brothers to bring some food from his father and he heard the philistine uh mocking the people he heard goliath mocking the people he did not look at himself and then look at at goliath to determine whether goliath could be overcome no david had learned to put his trust in god when he killed a lion and he killed a bear with his bare hands he knew that God was with him, and he knew that God would be with him to overcome Goliath. He had the faith. He had, he had the experience with God where he had developed that relationship with God, that oneness with God where, where he had complete trust in him. The problem here is his people didn't. So that night that they came back, the whole community raised their voices and wept aloud. And they said, let us choose a leader and go back to, to Egypt. They were absolutely walking with no faith. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They thought Egypt was going to be better for them. Well, Egypt was a place of slavery. E Egypt was a place where they had no freedom. And yet they were willing to go back to Egypt rather than to trust God. And we have to be careful of that because that, that can easily happen to us. We'd rather go back to the world than to trust God. You know, three of my favorite verses in the Bible that have been so powerful to me are the ones in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3, where um, Romans 1, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, tells us what God wants from us, that he wants us to be a living sacrifice. Verse 2 tells us how to be a living sacrifice, how to uh, walk with the Lord. And verse 3 tells us how not to lose it. Those are very, very powerful things for us to read and to understand. Because by understanding them, we know that we have to walk in relationship with God. We have to walk in relationship with him to the point that our faith is unwavering. That our faith is solid in him. That no matter what something looks like with our eyes, that we will trust him. Because what's the worst thing that can happen to us, right? In any situation, what's the worst thing we can happen to? Is we die. And if we die, what do we do? We go to be with the Lord. So how is that a bad thing? That's not a bad thing to go into eternity, is it? I guess like all of us, we don't mind the idea of going into eternity. We just don't want to be there when we die, right? <laughs> and that's a, that's a difficulty we have, right? But it, 
we just need to have that trust in the Lord, right? But Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes and said, the land that we pass through and explore is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land flowing with milk and honey and give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone. The Lord is with us. Do not be frightened of them. This is this is a statement of faith that uh, Caleb and Joshua were speaking, right? Don't worry about these guys. Their protection is gone. They, they have nothing to fight with. They, they are shaking in their boots. You know, we do not have to be frightened of them. But the people wanted to stone them because they were they were standing by faith. They were the ones that God looked to to say, say, you know, this is what I'm looking for. This is this is the type of faith we should have. But all the rest of the people, they wouldn't do it. They refused to, right? Because of the many years of slavery they uh, had been in, their idea of God had been tainted. And they had a hard time overcoming um, that time of bondage and allowing them to build relationship with God. And so they all ended up dying in the wilderness, all except Caleb and Joshua. And it was their children and grandchildren that inherited the land. Their children and grandchildren who had seen God from a young age, had seen God doing all these things, and they had put their complete trust into what God was doing. The Lord said to Moses, how long these people refuse to believe in me despite all the miraculous signs I have performed among them. I will strike them down and raise a greater nation through you. Moses said, the Egyptians will hear about it and the people of this land have already heard you, what you have done for these people. The Lord said, all those under 21 and older who left Egypt will die in the wilderness except Joshua and Caleb. And that's what they did, right? They would spend one year in the wilderness for each day they explored the land. None of the adults would see the promised land. So they spent 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because of a lack of faith. If, if we struggle in putting faith in God, if we struggle in putting our whole um, trust in the Lord, then we are going to be stuck in the wilderness until, until that comes about. And unfortunately... Many people die in the wilderness. You know, I heard a lot of people say, well, you know, it was the old man that was dying, the old self that was dying. And yeah, that's part of it. But there's more to it than just that, right? It's, it's about us desiring to walk in intimacy with God. It's about us working on that intimacy with God. If anybody has been married for any length of time, you know that marriage is work. My wife and I have been married for 47 years. I think last year when we were married about 46, she got talking with somebody on an airplane one time and um, something about marriage came up. So she said, my husband and I have been married for 46 years. And the, the person looked at her and said, man, that's a lot of work. And it is. Marriage is work. But that's the value that comes out of the work that you put into a relationship it is the closeness that you have afterwards. It's the same thing with God. If you value your relationship with him and your closeness with him, then there becomes a trust and a faith built into him that you can abide in peace, right? I said, Jesus came to give us peace. How do we get the peace? By abiding in the Father, by being there, knowing that whatever happens, he will look after it. Whatever the situation is, he's got something. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter what the situation is. There's always something there that he can do for that, right? Your children will be sheep herders here for 40 years, suffering from the unfaithfulness until the last year bodies lies in the desert. Why are they suffering? Because of unfaithfulness. Because their parents were unfaithful to God. They were not walking by faith. They were walking by sight. They weren't walking in the faith that God has called them to walk in. We, 
we are in a place where we have a greater advantage than the children of Israel who were going through the desert. We have their stories. We have the stories of what happens afterwards. We have the prophetic words. We have the written word. We, we know what Jesus did for us. We know that he went to the cross and he rose again. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We are the dwelling place of God. And yet, it is still amazing how many people still falter at believing in God. That still falter in knowing and having faith in everything that God is going to do. In Romans chapter 8, he says that he works all things for good for those who are called and loved, who are loved and called according to his purposes. All things. He works all things for good. doesn't matter how bad it seems. He works it through good. We can put our trust in that. We can put our faith in that. We can choose to do that. But we have to choose. And until we come to a point of choosing, God is going to allow situations to come in our life over and over and over again until we learn the lesson to put our trust in him. Amen? Until we learn to put our trust in him. If you feel like you're just like a mouse on a wheel going around and around and around and nothing seems to be changing, maybe you need to take a stop and look and see what God is trying to teach you that you're not learning. Maybe you're not willing to put your faith and trust in him completely. But that's what is necessary in order for him to fulfill the destiny that he has for your life. Because it's not about you. I know people get shocked when you say that because you go into a lot of countries, especially the Western world, and all you hear is, I, 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 me, me, me. And it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's not about what we do. It's about what he's done. It's not about what we can do, what God can do for us. It's about what we can do for him. It's about giving of ourselves. It's not about taking. Amen. So in Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 to 24, I'm not going to read it. Of course, I'll just give some highlights here. This is when the children of Israel are getting ready to go into the promised land. And they sent some more spies in to Rahab. Uh, to speak to her and it says here for the spies laid down that night she went up on the roof and said to them I know that your Lord has given you the land this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that we all live in this country are melting with fear because of you we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt what you did uh, with Sion and Og and the two kings of the Amorite east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is a God in heaven above and on the earth below. What is amazing here is their enemies had more faith than the Israelites. The enemies in in Canaan land that they were going to destroy, that they were going to overthrow, had more faith that God was going to do it for them than the children of Israel did. And that that's all backwards, isn't it? That, that, that's not the way we should. Uh, the demons around us shouldn't be fearing us be, and have more faith in God than what we have. Right? We should be having complete faith in God in what he's going to do for us. And so it's just showing us here that, you know, they they came, those 10 spies, saying, like, we we look like grasshoppers in their eyes and, you know, we, in our own eyes and in their eyes also. Well, it wasn't the truth. They didn't look like grasshoppers in the other people's eyes because the other people's eyes were shaking in fear because they knew the God that was with them. They knew the God was going to overthrow everything that was necessary. They were shaking in their boots. And yet what the Israelites seen is they looked at themselves. They compared themselves to the situation in front of them. And they had fear. As soon as you compare yourself. And you're not comparing with God. Then you get into trouble. Amen. You get into trouble. 
If you don't look through God's eyes, and you're only looking through your own eyes, then you're looking with your, your own sight, only the physical things. You're not seeing the spiritual things. Because it's only through faith that we can see the spiritual. It's only through faith that we can see what God wants to do. These people, they, they weren't even God-fearing people. They were the wicked people, the evil people of the land that God wanted to destroy, that he wanted to take out of the land. And they knew they were in trouble. For 40 years, they knew they were in trouble. For 40 years, they had been waiting for the children of Israel to get enough faith to cross over the Jordan and to come and take the land that they knew God was giving them. They knew they knew what was happening. And yet the children of Israel couldn't see it themselves because they were so focused on themselves. When you become focused on yourself, you make a very small picture, right? When you become focused on yourself, you are blinded to what God can do. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. There's none of us that are any better than anybody else. There's none of us that are more important than anybody else. There's none of us that have anything that's greater than anybody else. We are all people created by God. And God has given us giftings and abilities to do to fulfill the destiny that he has for us but it's not because of who we are it's because he has chosen to and so if god has blessed you and given you a gift or an ability then you need to use that gift and ability not to bring glory to yourself or to your name but to bring it to the lord right you know in the entertainment industry you get people that are that are very good at acting or singing or, you know, playing musical instruments or whatever. And it's all about me, 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 you know, and we're all lifting them up and exalting them. No, that's not what the, what it's meant to be. It's meant to be about giving glory to God because it is God that gives the gifts. It's God that gives us the abilities. So here the children of Israel were shaking in their boots, thinking these giants are in the land. They're just laughing at us, thinking that we're grasshoppers and that they're just going to stomp on us. But that's not the truth. The truth is they were shaking in their boots. Their hearts had melted. For 40 years, they were just waiting uh, for the children of Israel to cross the Jordan River because they knew what was going to happen to them. And so it was a very difficult thing. It was a very difficult thing that was happening. And it was really, really a huge struggle for them. So I hope that little session there was a blessing to you. Because this ultimately is what this journey is about. This journey is about learning to walk in intimacy with God. To learn to walk by faith, not by sight. Learn to trust God in everything that he wants to do. That's, that's what this journey from the Egypt to the promised land is all about. And how long it takes us is up to us. Because they could have been there in one year. You know, they, they left Egypt. They spent a year at Mount Sinai. When they sent the 10 spies into the land, God was ready to send them into the land right there and then. But because they refused to believe that God could do it, they had to spend another 40 years in the wilderness. Why did they spend 40 years in the wilderness? Because they didn't have the faith. They didn't have faith to go and do what it what needed to be done. They, they didn't have a trust in God. They were looking with their eyes and they were looking at themselves. And in order to walk by faith, in order to walk in maturity, we got to stop looking at ourselves and look at God. Because looking at ourselves just gets us into trouble, right? It is amazing to me how many people in the world are self-centered. I mean, the way the way this world's going and the way kids are raised nowadays, it's getting worse and worse and worse. There's so much self-centeredness and so much greed around that that is just amazing, right? How can we fulfill the journey that God is calling us to when we're so focused on ourselves? We can't. We have to deny ourselves. We have to put ourselves down and put Jesus at the top amen <laughs> so i hope that uh, I somebody saying something 
Amen. So we've got another section we're going to do here today. See how our time goes here. Amen. And this comes from Numbers 21. So if you want to turn to Numbers 21. Now, this is a, a very confusing portion of scripture for many people. But I, I think probably most of you, you're in Bible school, so you probably, most of you understand about this. This is where Moses lifts up the bronze snake in the wilderness. This is where, where God tells Moses to lift up the the snake in the wilderness so in verse four he starts out there the people grew impatient and spoke against god why have you brought us out of egypt to die in the desert you know is there there's no bread there's no water we detest this miserable food you know there was no thankfulness for what god had done they had no thankfulness in their heart even though they seen all the things that happened even though God told them that they would spend 40 years in the wilderness and they would all die off. They still did not change their heart, right? And the Lord sent venomous snakes among them and they bit the people and many died. So that's kind of a, a bad thing that's happening there. Some of the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So they, they repented quickly when they were suffering because of what they'd said and what they've done. And Moses prayed for the people. The Lord told Moses to make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. And Moses made a snake of bronze and put it on a pole. And anyone who was bitten looked at the bronze snake and lived. Why? Why would God use a snake to heal these people? And we, we know what a snake represents, right? A snake re represents evil. or A snake represents everything that's bad. I don't think there's anybody that really likes snakes. You know, we live here in Africa in the middle of a village, and we have snakes fairly often in our compound. The kids all come running whenever they see a snake so dad can go dispose of it. So nobody gets bit or anything. But snakes aren't a good thing, right? And they represent the evil. So why would God use a snake to heal the people? It seems counterproductive, right? It's, it just seems it seems off. It seems backwards. Excuse me. But this is what he did. If we go to John chapter 3, verse 14 to 16, Jesus said that he must be lifted up as Moses lifted the snake in the wilderness. Just as Moses lifted the snake in the desert, the Son of Man must be lifted, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So here, Jesus is even comparing himself to the snake that Moses raised up in the wilderness. Is it just as Moses raised the snake in the wilderness, the son of man must also be raised up. So we know that God doesn't put anything in by accident, right? Everything has a purpose. So why is he comparing Jesus to a snake? Why, why does Jesus even himself say that unless I'm lifted, like Moses lifted the snake in the wilderness, no one can be saved, which doesn't really make any sense, right? Because the 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 symbolism of a snake is evil. The symbolism of a snake is corruption. It's it's sin. It's it's everything that's bad, right? We have the the prophecy in Genesis where where God said to to the serpent, you know. The child will bruise your, you will bruise the heel of the child, but he will crush your head. You know, so he's talking about the Satan being crushed, right? But what what's with the snake thing, right? In order to understand this, we have to understand what Jesus did on the cross. We have to understand 
that Jesus took all our infirmities, all our sin on himself. He became sin. He became everything that sin represented. That's what the snake did, right? The snake represented everything evil. The snake represented everything bad. So that's why the act of Moses lifting that bronze snake in the wilderness was a prophetic act of what was going to happen at the cross. The sin, the very thing that represents sin, was going to be lifted up and was going to bring salvation to all who gazed upon it. As the children of Israel looked at this bronze snake after they were bitten, they were healed. And so it's the same thing for us. Jesus becomes that snake. Jesus becomes the sin because he takes all of our sin upon himself. Not that he is sin. He has no sin himself whatsoever. Yet he was willing to take all of our sin from the Garden of Eden right to the end of the age. He was willing to take all of our sin upon himself and take it to the cross. And when we gaze upon Jesus, when we look at him upon the cross, I know we can't physically see him there because we weren't there at the time. But in the spirit realm, by faith, we can see him there suffering for us. He became sin. He lifted sin up. He took sin to the cross for us and paid the price for us so that we could be free. And when we gaze upon him, we receive a healing. When we gaze upon him, we have salvation. When we gaze upon him, we are set free. Just like Moses did with the children of Israel uh, with the snake on the stick. He became that snake. So it's not that evil is something that we worship or we look upon. It's that Jesus, who is perfect, became sin for us that we might be set free. He paid a price that we could be free. We've mentioned before, under the old law, there were 613 laws. And out of that 613 laws, 36 of those laws um, if you broke those laws, were punishable by death. And Peter tells us that if if you are guilty of one breaking one law, you're guilty of all the law. So that means we're all guilty of death. We're all guilty of not living. Yet Jesus became sin for us so that we could overcome death. He became that sacrifice on the cross. He became the sacrifice for us that we could have eternal life. Just like the children of Israel looked upon the snake in the wilderness and they were healed. We look upon Jesus and we have we have eternal life. He heals us body, soul, and spirit. And we have eternal life. And that's, that's quite amazing for us when we look at that. When we see what he has done for us. Amen. I have a feeling some of you have some comments or questions on that. So just open it up if anybody has a comment or a question. Go ahead, Evan, Moses, if you want. Yes, I want. So my question is the same here, that why did you just uh, represent that himself as a snake? I mean, you cleared it, but uh, as you said that he he become a symbol of a snake. So I mean, always uh, we see as a snake as a evil and uh, the so, I mean, why he, there's a, another symbol we can represent, but when we preach like that, many people will be worship the snake also, maybe. Yeah, well, we're not supposed to worship the snake, right? We're supposed to worship what it represents. Yeah. It, rep represents yes. the, it re represents the perfect and the pure becoming contaminated with our sin and dying for us, right? Yes. Jesus was not the snake. He's just a representation, right? When he takes a sin upon himself, he's a representation of our evil, of our sin that he takes to the cross for us, right? So we shouldn't be worshiping snakes. No, that's not a good idea. Yeah, no, I mean, 
the if we tell the many people it, this this question many people will ask many times when we preach uh, the Moses um, Moses lift up the snake on the cross that and with the Jesus Christ that the many people ask this the why is next so when we say it like that that Jesus represent himself as a snake or as a symbolized as a snake Maybe they will, they will uh, worship, or they will like snake also. That's that one. Yeah, I see. that's why it's important to make clear to them that Jesus, yeah. Jesus was like a snake in that he took our sin upon himself. Yes, right, and it's him that we yeah. worship because he's perfect, not the snake. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir, William. Please, uh, uh, please. <laughs> I wish to ask. I wish to ask about the various tribes of uh, Israel. I don't know if uh, there's a prophetic significance as to why some of the tribes were organized in the north some in the south and some in the west and east. I don't know if there is a, uh, a significance as to why some of them are placed at some particular positions. Yeah, I'm not sure if it just has to do with numbers or probably there is some significance in there. I haven't studied that part. Out. I mean, you can... You can go on this stuff for many years and just go through everything. I I mean, obviously, the numbers would have to be right in order for it to look like a cross, right? So, yeah, that's all I can say. I haven't I haven't studied anything out with the, with the tribes as to why they would be grouped together in those specific groupings. Okay, thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Anybody else have anything? <laughs> Question or comment? Okay, as in last time, I will be sending the link to the video and the notes. Um, and uh, Davey will send them up to you. So I hope you all are looking forward to that. Uh, we have one more session next week. And we're going to bring this to a conclusion. We're going to talk quite a bit about what our destiny is. Because I've been, I've been referencing this destiny throughout these messages, but I haven't really talked about what it is, and that was on purpose, because we needed to get there before we could understand what it was about. So next time we're going to bring everything to a conclusion, and we'll talk about our destiny and, and what our destiny is. Because I personally believe all our destiny is the same thing. It, it manifests in a different way, but it's all the same thing. So any other questions or comments? I'm losing my voice really fast here because of this cold. So. Per Lamar, do you have a question? You're you put your mic on a few no, times. No, 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 sir. Okay. Okay, let me pray for you, and then we will close off and we will be back next week at the same time. Okay.
But Father, we just thank you for this time we spent together. Father, we've covered so much ground here today. Father, we thank you for the shape of the cross that the people were moving in. We thank you that we are not like the 10 spies, but that we are like uh, Joshua and Caleb, who believe that when you say you're going to do something, you will. And Father, we we take this message from Rahab, how she said that the enemy was frightened right from the time they crossed over the Red Sea, knowing that you were going to bring them into the promised land and that they were going to be disposed from that land. Well, Father, give us courage, give us boldness to know that we can overcome anything when you are with us, that if you are calling us to do it, we are overcomers and we can go far and above beyond what uh, the enemy wants for us or what God wants for us, what <clears throat> not what God wants for us, but what what this what our plan is. And Father, we thank you for this uh, representation of the snake in the wilderness. What a powerful message it is for us that Jesus becomes evil for us. He becomes sin. He takes all the sin upon him and he takes a punishment for our sins. And for that, we are truly thankful. Lord, just bless each one that's here today. Lord, just bless them and keep them. Father, we thank you for each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my brother. Amen. I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, brother, for the class. Yes. Okay, anything you want to say? No, I'm good. Okay, okay. Thank you so much for the class. Um, I hope anything anyone wants to say or uh, just to close. Thank you so much, sir, for our, our classes. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you next week. See you. See you too. See you next week.